Ladies and gentlemen, Mac Lamore. Yo, I just caught a chill, man. Don't do that no more, man. That, that, sorry, that, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yo, that cheer was like, that's a, do it again, please. Seattle! <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not really going to wear sunglasses inside. And I just want to come out and look cool in an Indiana Jones hat and stuff. <laughs> I was going to, my first question was about the hat. Damn. All right, hold on. <laughs> Talk Rewind. About, talk about the hat. That, is that a drift shop hat? That's not a drift shop hat. This is, smell it, man. It smells horrible. <laughs> Absolutely. Incredible, man. Absolutely. You're dapper today. Thank you, you, sir. you did an Instagram with some Jordans, but those are different Jordans you have on now, right? Yes, yes, yes. And you had a rare pair today. There was some, I, I, I'm not a big sneakhead. I was telling you backstage, like, yeah. what's the one you stunted on in the Instagram today? It's, it's a rare Jordan sneaker? It, it, you know, <laughs> Jordan has been Jordan brand. Um, Nike's been hooking us up with shoes for a couple years now. Yeah. But Jordan brand has its own thing. It's like its own company within Nike. And to get a hold of Jordan brand is extremely difficult. It's like some covert operation. Like, you need to be <laughs> really high up in the ranks. And, you know, I would try to get, like, the introduction, and no one would ever email me back. And, you know, and finally, <laughs> I think uh, Thrift Shop hit number one, and then the Jordan guy was like, hey, what's up, man? You want some shoes? <laughs> so it's, it's very appreciated because, you know, you get, you get them a little bit early and you feel special and, you know, you're feeding into the machine at the same time. It's funny. I mean, obviously, you, you've spoken about Drift Shop eight million times, but it's, it's funny how, like, in music, like, you know, you paid a lot of dues in rap for a long time before you became where you're at right now. And it's like I always tell artists... Really, it's going to ultimately take that one record that kind of just opens all the doors for you. Like, you never know when it's going to happen, but it's that one record. How crazy is that for you? It's Drift Shop. Like, that's the record that, like, opened everything. I mean, it, it was this time last year that we had rented a U-Haul. And by we, I mean I rented a U-Haul. <laughs> and The Macklemore credit card? Yes, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> just about at the overdraft level. And, um, <laughs> and you know, we're driving around Seattle, going to the thrift shops that, that, we, that I frequent, that me and my girl frequent, and, uh, you know, asking them, can we shoot this music video here? And, um, yeah, I mean, things were happening slowly around the world, and, you know, it's obviously started here in Seattle, but to have that video be to, you know, go viral and then months and months later, you know, around January, have it pop off at radio. It, um, we never thought that we had a single and we definitely never thought that Thrift Shot was going to be that song. Like, it was just this weird, like, concept, like, about pissy clothes and <laughs> it, it, it just wasn't, it, it, I was like, there's, there's no, it never <laughs> registered that it was even a possibility of getting played on any radio station and, um, and it just took off. And why do you, th why do you think it worked? Why do you think it, it's so atypical? Why do you think it, it connected to people? Um, I think that for, for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, you have a beat that, that has this catchy saxophone loop. And, you know, you get the melody stuck in your head. Wands, who's on the hook. It was, um, you know, a very catchy hook. I'm rapping about things that I think um, were different. And the record was different. But if you listen to hip hop in terms of what was getting played on the radio in the last couple of years, it's been very similar in the sense of like um, 70 BPM, turn up, like everything yeah. kind of had the same vibe. Like the hi hat sounded the same, the, you know, the snares sound the same, like the general feel is, you know, let's, let's turn up, let's spend money. Like it, this was a record that was um, faster. It was a record that really went against pretty much what every other, you know, mainstream radio record was promoting, which was like, let's spend money and make it rain and like buy the most expensive stuff. This was save money and I'm frugal and I'm a cheap bastard. <laughs> um, so I think that I think that it and it had a video that really backed up the song um, that gave it an identity. And that's something that 
Ryan and I have really worked on developing and putting time and energy in, into these videos, you know, making these videos like short movies and treating them like they're the most important thing besides the music, because I think that they are. And people are like, you know, a lot of the, the way that record labels work is like, they're like, you know, you have a certain budget, you have 48 hours, knock out a video. Me and Ryan are like, let's spend all of our money on this video. And even if we go broke and spend a month doing it and it doesn't matter. It, it's always like, you know, how do you, how do you spend your time? And, and it comes down to, um, you know, me and Ryan and, and our manager, Zach, and, and my, um, you know, fiance slash producer slash tour manager, Trisha, and, and kind of our close team. And we talk about, you know, how to, does this make sense? Does this not make sense? But we don't have these like deadlines that are like, you need to keep up with the industry pace. It's a very atypical rap family in a sense. Yes. You have a booking agent who became your manager. Your fiance is your tour manager. Yes. And your personal photographer became your main producer and partner in life, yeah. Brian Lewis. <laughs> what kind of sicko, dysfunctional, <laughs> no new friends colony are you running, Ben? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. it. Needs to be the bio. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, there's a lot of reasons. I think that, for one, Ryan and I have, our artistry expands just, you know, me rapping and Ryan making beats. Um, Ryan is is a machine, man. He's a force. And he, he gets it. He gets graphic design. He gets how to, like, you know, work Photoshop. And, and he gets photography. He, he understands how to cut video. He knows how to shoot video. Um, most producers don't know how to do that. Yeah. I don't think any do. They just knock it upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think that there, there's that aspect. And, and I've always been a very visual person as well in terms of, um, you know, my background. I was a visual artist growing up just as I was an MC, And, um, you know, there, there's that reason. So a lot of people where, where they would normally outsource stuff where they're not in control, where it's like, all right, we need to hire another team to produce this video. We're like, you know, my girl's got a good eye. Like, let's put her behind this video, see how it turns out. Turned out great, let's do it again. We all learn as we go along, and I think that that's been the beautiful thing the last couple of years is learning, making mistakes, growing, and keeping it going. And we've all kind of taken on so many different roles within this camp, but um, you know, everyone does like five different jobs, yeah. whereas like you would normally hire a, a whole team to do it, a big team. I wanna talk about this thing that you did, I don't know if people are really aware, you know, you maintain your independence, but you hired Warner Brothers, the, uh, a radio division, I guess, to get clarity on it, like to sort of work the records to mainstream radio. But you, you know, a lot of times when that happens, there's always this hope that, you know, we're going to work your records and eventually you're going to sign with us because you're going to see what a great job we do to get you guys get mainstream radio play. But you guys did that and it helped the success of Drift Shop and then um, Can't Hold Us and, and even now Same Love. But... You're not signing to Warner Brothers. Like, talk a little bit about the innovation of that, because I just think it's a very innovative move you guys made as independent artists to work within the system, but still stand on your own. So <laughs> I remember very specifically being on the road. Um, I bought a skateboard. I was like skateboarding to like a Chinese restaurant in the middle of like Wisconsin or something, and and finally getting on the phone with my manager and and having this conversation where he was like, you know, if we do this there's the potential that it goes. And by goes, meaning like that this takes off. And do you want this? Because we were at a crossroads. We were, we were popular, but there's a, there's a, what can make you a star in the music industry is radio. That is the thing that will, that will turn you into a star. That the majors still have a- That the majors advantage. still have leverage with. Yeah. Um, you know? And we, we could be independent, we could sell a bunch of records, but in terms of becoming like a star, that's what radio has to offer still, is that connection to radio. And, um, you know, we worked at a really creative deal where like we weren't signing, we were giving them a, a slightly higher percentage, but maintaining creative control. We had all the deal worked out in what we believe to be our favor, 100% independent still, but having this conversation with my manager and he's like, you know, if we do this um, and it works, this is gonna change your life. And do you want that? You could be a really successful 
independent act for the rest of your life. Yeah. The touring is the touring is the touring is already yeah. great. Yeah. You know, you'll be able to live off this forever as it is. But if you if we do this and it works, do you want this life? And um, and I said yes. And I didn't. And it, it was it was a de- it was a debate in my head. It wasn't a no brainer. Um, but we had gone that far. The record had done so much on its own. And you know, I always said, I always thought growing up, people would would say, you know, what's the ideal for you? Because I was a backpack rapper from Seattle. You know, playing shows at Shop Suey up the street for for 200 people out of the 500 capacity that it was. I did that forever. I was I was an underground rapper and. People would always ask me, like, what's the, if, if you could envision your career, where would it be? And my answer to that has always been, I want my music to connect with as many people as possible. Yeah. And but maintain your artistic integrity. But, but maintain integrity. my artistic yeah. integrity yeah. And, and, and continue to do me and, and be myself on records. Um, but that's been my, my, my dream. And with, with Thirst Shot, we decided to do it. And we decided to, to go with Warner and... We, we signed the deal right around New Year's. Shortly after that, it was like, and it just went. And So how did you feel when you saw the results? Like, um, so- you know, it was, it was an interesting time because on one level. How was my man RL feeling? How was he feeling about things? Because <laughs> I interview I you guys both for respect, and I always feel like Ryan's role is like, I mean, you're determined too. You both have tremendous integrity, yeah. but he's like kind of like the, the he's the conscience in some sense. Like he's gonna make sure you never compromise. You know, your, you've your said thing. this to me before. I don't know where you're getting that. From. <laughs> you don't agree with that? Ryan's like, let's make some money. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's like, I got some EDMs. I got some B- BPMs, man. I'm Turn like, up. I'm like, I'm that dude. I'm the voice of reason. <laughs> He's the devil. I'm the angel. No, but you were saying so around the early part of the year, you started seeing the results. You make the tough decision to do it. And then when you start seeing results, you said it was, it was a tough time going on around that time? Well, yeah. I mean, so the song pops off and it becomes, and it doesn't just pop off. It becomes <laughs> like the biggest <laughs> song in the world for a yeah. minute. Yeah. And I never thought that I would have that record. Um the record that is like, you turn on like any four radio stations and is playing at the same time type yeah. of record, um, type of record where you're like, get that fucking saxophone out of my head. <laughs> record. <laughs> um, so, you know, and with that came came criticism, yeah. and you know, all of a sudden you're that dude with that song in the country, and that's what people know you as. You are immediately the thrift shop guy. Yeah. And you are um, a one-hit wonder. And the first couple months of the year were, um, they were rough, for sure. I mean, we had this immense success, very exciting on one end. And on another end, it's like, um, I'm in a box right now. And I don't know um, if I'm going to be able to get out of this box. And it was it was scary. It was it was really scary. But no, but then the only way you cannot be a one hit wonder is to have a second hit. And then you put "Can't Hold Us," uh, which was a previously released song. Again, that song was was well. That song was older. Thirst Shop wasn't older, but that song was older. We had already put it out. Um, we always knew that it had you know this this beat, this like this pounding. It sounded like a, a soccer anthem, like your team just won the Super Bowl type of type of beat and um you know i'm not rapping about anything on that track like i'm talking about shark week and stuff and (laughs) it's one of the 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 rare records that i write that wasn't conceptual so we rearranged it a little bit we put the hook first and then my verse and rearranged it and um and filmed the video we were in hawaii and we were sitting down and it was around the, the thrift shop conversation as well and i was like what if we got a pirate ship And I was like, and what if we had uh, a flag? And we were like, kind of like, it was like we were passing the torch. And, you know, and then another idea came. And then Ryan's like, yo, let's get on dogs and like run in the snow. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> perfect. Now we got something. Yeah, now, now it's there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a couple months later, a video comes out. And, and again, visuals that, that give a song an identity. 
we put a ton of time and energy into it. And it was a weird, random video that somehow, um, you know, again, popped off on the internet. But I think more than anything, the radio was ready for, for another song after Thirst Shop. And it was the biggest relief of my career to have another song um, go because, you know, and then I was like, the ceiling can't hold us, guy, but it was much better than like. <laughs> it seems like after Can't Hold Us, you, now you're pushing Same Love, which again is revisit, yes. revisiting another record. Yes. <laughs> Obviously. Obviously, that's such a strong song about gay rights and tackling, you know, topic that hip hop was always speaking of fearful. Like, was you fearful of the rap community's, uh, you know, reaction to it? Like, what made it feel like I'm just going to take this on and be honest about it? I know it was also kind of a long process to write it, right? Because you wanted to make sure you hit the right note. Absolutely. With the, with the song. Yeah, I was. I was definitely. Um, I was definitely cautious of of that record. I mean, out of anything that I've ever written in my life, that was the, the first two bars, the first bar of that song was the most vulnerable in terms of like being a rapper and saying when I was in the third grade, I thought that I was gay. Um, that was the most vulnerable I had ever gotten on a record. That was one of those that I'm like, damn, do I really want to say this? <laughs> Can I just edit that bar out and leave the rest of it? Um, but it was important, you know, it, it, it's my story. And if I censor it, then I'm not doing my job as an artist. And I think that it, the record did take me a, a while to write. I knew that I wanted to write it. I, I, I held off on it, I just kind of brainstormed it. I tried writing from the perspective of a bullied gay kid. This is not my story, it's not who I am. And, and Ryan was like, you know, I think that you have a story here. Talk about your life, talk about your experiences. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's because your uncles and my uncles and, and thinking I was gay in the third grade and talking about hip hop music and, and the way that, that we perceive and, and the fear that that we have in our community and um, just speaking from my perspective and you have there's so much battling that goes on in terms of the songwriting process, at least for me, you know, staring at a piece of paper, writing bullshit like I write. 99% bullshit. And every once in a while, something good comes out. And I'm like, yes. Like, why <laughs> can't I is. do this all the time? Um, but in Same Love was like that. It was like, no, I was trying. I was trying to write this song. I was trying to think of this concept. I was, I was trying to get there. And, and finally, it was like, dude, just talk from your personal experience. This is not complicated. This is very simple. Say what you feel in your heart. And that's the process of being a writer, is constantly shifting through the bullshit to get through that, like what's in your heart, but you have to be connected to it. And, 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 and when I started writing, it was like, yes, this is exactly what I need to write. And am I scared that people aren't gonna wanna, in, in hip hop, aren't gonna wanna collaborate? Kinda, yeah, I am. Um, will people think that I'm gay? They still do. <laughs> 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 you type in Macklemore on Google and you type you start typing Macklemore and it says immediately like autocorrects to is Macklemore gay? <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know what? Um that's that's not important to me. Like I could honestly care less. What's what's important to me is something much bigger than how I'm perceived and you know who might or might not want to make a record. Like if people are really not wanting to get on a record with me because of that we weren't meant to make music together. Like, this yeah. is something that I believe in. This is something that I'm willing to, to put out there. And yeah, I remember thinking like, cause, cause we had same love. And then I remember like, schoolboy Q coming to the studio. And you know, Q's like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> Q's, I mean, Q's like, you know, he's kind of a gangster rapper. like. I mean, he's not really, but he kind of is. Like, you know, he's like, he's, he kind of is. And, <laughs> and, um, individual. you know, I remember, I remember being like, man, like, you know, if Q hears this, like, he's not want to, he's not going to want to get on our record. Like, I'm not going to play this for Q. And, um, I didn't play it for Q. 
<laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm like, eventually, like, he was obviously going to hear this. And he always texts me and shit. And pictures of hearts with hashtag same love. <laughs> The fact that it's a song that is played on mainstream radio in America means that it is creating a dialogue. People are hearing the lyrics to this song about marriage equality. And whether you agree with it or you don't agree with it, you are forced until you turn that radio dial to to listen to it. And hopefully that leads to conversation. Hopefully that leads to dialogue. And with that, I I believe the change occurs. And and Thrift Shop, and can't hold us were the catalyst. And then Same Love, which is to me, in my heart, the most important song that I've ever written, got embraced by the masses. Mm-hmm.